Good afternoon, everyone. I cordially welcome you all for the fifth lecture of the short course on cultural linkages towards an Asian ideology. Today, we are focusing on the English language for cultural linkages towards an Asian ideology and beyond. The program for today is such that the lecture is scheduled to be for 45 minutes with a short break of five minutes, followed by a question and answer session. Ladies and gentlemen, may I have the honor of introducing our lecturer, Mr. Kitsiri Amaratunga, Dean of the Faculty of Management, Social Sciences and Humanities at the General Sir John Kotalawala Defense University. Our esteemed guest holds a Master of Philosophy in English from the University of Cali in Sri Lanka, a Master of Arts in Linguistics from the University of Kalania, and a Bachelor of Arts degree specialized in English with second class honors from the University of Peraveni in Sri Lanka and has undergone various training in Sri Lanka and the USA. Mr. Kitsire Amrathunga is a senior academic in the field of English language and literature with over 35 years of experience in teaching at various levels and over 17 years of experience in university administration. Mr. Amaritunga has held many important positions at KDU, which include Senior Lecturer in English, Head of the Department of Languages, Chairman of the Editorial Committee of the International Research Conference, and Editorial Board Member of the Annual Journal, The Silhouette. Outside of KDU, he has served at the University of Colombo, the British Council in Colombo, the Advanced Technological Institute in Colombo, the Sri Lanka Institute of Development Administration and in government schools in Sri Lanka. Mr. Amaratunga's research interests lie in the fields of English and English language teaching, English literature, applied and historical and social linguistic, translation studies, and Buddhist philosophy. He has published research articles in the International Journal of Science and Research, books such as Megal and Words Epitomizing Leadership related to KDU and many other articles on a broad range of topics. Sir, we are profoundly honored to have you with us here and we warmly welcome you to deliver this lecture. Thank you. Right. Um, uh, thank you very much for uh, that introduction. Uh, good afternoon, uh, students. Very warmly welcome to this lecture on the English language for cultural linkages towards an Asian ideology and beyond. So this is the uh, this is one of the lectures in the series of lectures that have been conducted by the Department of Social Sciences of our faculty. Uh, so uh, uh, this particular lecture that I'm conducting today deals with the English language. Uh, for cultural linkages towards an Asian ideology and beyond. Uh, so uh, I would like to um, mention that uh, I am aware of the kind of audience that I am having, uh, the students from the different faculties at KDU, and I'm sure uh, there are students from the Faculty of Medicine, Faculty of Engineering, Faculty of Law, and all other faculties. And the audience is having different kinds of specialities uh, uh, for their studies. And therefore, I'm aware of the differences of your interest. But I'm also aware that this kind of lectures on cultural linkages towards the nation ideology will of course be of immense use to anybody, respective of their different 
study areas. So by now, I am sure you have faced, you have, uh, uh, you have listened to several lectures in this line, and you are familiar with the kind of stuff that you are encountering in this series of lectures. Uh, so without much ado, I would like to get on to the business of delivering this lecture. So um, this is just an overview of what you will be encountering during the one and a half hours or so today. So in this particular lecture, I will be giving you a basic introduction to the concepts, relevant basic concepts that will be important for the understanding of this particular lecture. And then the, what I call the imperialist project and the English language, then the post-colonial project and the English language, and then the, the world Englishes and new literatures, then globalization and the use of the English language, the role of the English language. And then uh, what I call the pan-Asianism versus Eurocentrism, centrism, and then commonality of cultures and ideologies, and alternative Asian ideology and conclusion. So this is an overview of the progression that I have planned for this particular lecture. Some of you may find it quite problematic to understand some of these uh, words and concepts that have been over here on, on, on the slide. But then uh, just try to uh, bear it up and I will try my best to explain them uh, in, in simple terms. But um, basically uh, what I need is your attention, full attention so that you will grasp something that will be of use for your future careers and for your uh, future progression. As, as, uh, as professionals in different fields. And so uh, the introduction to basic concepts. Now, ideology is a word that you have already heard and you must have already got to know what an ideology means. Anybody in the audience who could tell me the meaning of the term ideology as you understand? Sir, uh, may I say that it is a specific thought or a thought process that uh, a set of people follow or uh, have an idea of uh, following uh, in a specific era regarding something. Okay. Right. Who is that, please? Uh, I'm Merosha Shenani, sir, from the Faculty of Law. Okay, Nirosha. Okay, thank you uh, for helping me uh, by coming out with some kind of uh, definition. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so this is like, uh, yeah, during a particular period of time, as you mentioned, and also um, community or a group of people, maybe a country, maybe a larger uh, segment of population, um, people having some common ideas, common way of thinking. Um, that they generally accept as true and correct. So ideology is something that you cannot sort of show clearly. And that is something there inside and in, the, in, a, in a particular culture. So, and a definition that I have taken from a dictionary is given here, an orientation that characterizes the thinking of a group or a nation an orientation, what kind of direction uh, that their thinking is in. So um, particularly of a nation or a segment of a nation. Uh, so when you talk about ideology, you may have heard uh, the, what, what kind of ideologies have you heard of? Uh, 
political ideology, social ideology. Yes, political ideology, good. So when you say political ideology, there again, you can say Marxist ideology, capitalist ideology. And so that is one way of thinking. So people believe in that way of thinking. Okay. So an ideology is a relative concept. That is very important. That is a relative concept. That is in relation to another ideology. Now, these are, these ideologies are binary oppositions or dichotomies or dualities. Now, these three terms uh, mean almost the same, but you must write it down somewhere and this will recur during my lecture, binary oppositions. Same thing, dichotomies or dualities. Now examples are like rich versus poor. Now these are examples for binary oppositions, rich versus poor, white versus black, ugly versus beautiful, one versus zero. So these are binary oppositions. Now in, uh, in uh, uh, political parlance, we have, uh, so when you, when you talk about ideologies, they are also in binary oppositions like the ones I mentioned. So you can say Asian ideology versus European ideology, Eastern ideology versus Western ideology, Marxist ideology versus capitalist ideology and democratic ideology versus autocratic ideology. So this way, ideologies also can be in binary oppositions. They are relative concepts. So this basic understanding is required uh, to follow my lecture about ideologies. Ideologies are also in binary oppositions. Next term, important term is culture. What do you understand by the term culture? Now, culture, of course, you must be able to say better, give a better definition. What is culture? Yes? Uh, set of values and uh, behavior patterns uh, recognized by a society. Okay, set of values and uh, behavior patterns accepted by a particular community, particular society, uh, particular country, particular nation, etc. Culture. Now we say we call it Sanskriti in Sinhala. So culture, once again, is something uh, uh, that you, you, you can't just show it. Now there are uh, things that are related to culture. Now, uh, as defined here, all the knowledge and values shared by a particular society or a community. For example, the language, religion, traditions, values, how you wear your dresses, the tools that you use, the way of life, geographical areas, etc. Are involved in culture. Now, when you talk about Sri Lankan culture, what are the things that come to your mind immediately? You say Sri Lankan culture. What kind of things come to your mind immediately? Nothing? Do you belong to the Sri Lankan culture or some other culture? Our traditions. Yeah, what kind of traditions? So what are our traditions? What are our languages? What are our religions? What are our values? What about the dress, tools and all that? Now, one thing that comes should come to your mind is like, 
uh, when you talk about Sri Lankan culture, whereby Dagabai Gamai Pansalai, right? Whereby Dagabai Gamai Pansalai, the, 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 the lake, the tank, uh, the Dagoba village, and the temple. So that is part of our culture. But today, of course, Vavai Dagabai Gamai Pansalai Tabarumai Maskade Malulela. Isn't that so? So uh, things have changed. Culture is another significant uh, feature of culture and ideology, both, are that they are changing. They are never static. They also change over time. Now, at a particular time, as somebody mentioned at the beginning, uh, the ideology is at a particular time in history. Uh, at this particular time, uh, that is there, and that might change in the future. The culture is also like that, that changes, but there is, it's like, it's like an iceberg. In an iceberg, you see only the tip of it, and underneath the sea, there is a huge area uh, of the iceberg. So culture is also like that. There is something underneath. What we see is just the, uh, the beliefs, the traditions, the values, and all that, but they, they have a big base, right? So um, uh, when you talk about the Sri Lankan culture, you can talk about the New Year celebrations, the Vesak festivals, the Christmas carols, and um, all sort of things. Now, uh, can be talked about. Um, so, culture is also a relative concept. Once again, we look at we can look at culture in binary oppositions, like our culture versus their culture versus means against, right? Uh, so England versus Australia, like that. Our culture versus their culture. Asian culture versus European culture. Eastern culture versus Western culture. Sinhalese versus Tamil culture. Buddhist versus Islamic culture. Civilian versus military culture. When you talk about KDU, you can talk about civilian culture versus military culture. So culture... Uh, Within cultures, there are subcultures. Now, uh, various levels of cultural identities, identifications are there. So even within KDU, there can be different cultures. Culture at the law faculty may be different from the culture of the medical faculty, right? So the way, way, way people do things, the values that people have, all this can so they are again in binary oppositions or dichotomies or dualities. Right. Now, Asian ideology versus Western ideology. Now we are talking about cultural linkages towards an Asian ideology. That is our main theme. Now, now, Asian ideology can only be understood in comparison to Western ideology. So they are, again, they are in binary oppositions. They are in dichotomies like black and white. Now, there is no Asian ideology that, that can be discussed without its binary opposition, Western ideology, or what you call Eurocentric thinking. Ironically, we cannot share Asian cultural linkages towards an Asian ideology without the common language of English. So that is an ironic thing. We talk about an Asian ideology, but what language do we have in common to talk about an Asian ideology? Now we can say Sri Lankan ideology, when you say Sri Lankan ideology, we, have, we, can, we can use the singular language. Uh, but, but again, there are, you know, Tamil language is also there, but it can be within the Tamil community. But then again, there is one language that can be learned. But when it comes to the Asian cultural linkages, 
Now, ironic, it is ironic that we have borrowed the language from the West and that is the English language. So now the question is, whose language is English? Whether it is their language, their means the people of the West, the Englishmen, the British, Americans, or is it ours? That is a question that we have to ask. So the, the significance of the role of the English language in establishing cultural linkages towards an Asian ideology must be emphasized. There is no other language. Can we use Hindi or Chinese or uh, any other Asian, Japanese, Asian language commonly among the Asians? There is no chance. So fortunately or unfortunately, we have got to depend on the English language. Now I will talk about what is called the imperialist, imperialist project and the English language. Now, what is imperialism? What do you understand by the term imperialism? Now, imperialism is the domination of the West. Uh, in, uh, the, the colonial masters like the, uh, the British coming and capturing countries like ours, Sri Lanka, India, uh, Pakistan, etc., and having captured them, uh, ruling those countries under the, uh, the British monarchy, under the Queen. So that, that is imperialism, uh, having uh, colonies for their uh, dominance. So that is called imperialist project. And then we are talking about the English language and the relationship between the imperialist project. Now this, this uh, in this now, uh, what happened was the English came and captured in the 1700s, in the 18th century, uh, they came to our parts of the world and they captured uh, our countries and then uh, we were governed and ruled by them. And for that, what was the tool that they used? Their culture and their culture came to the English language and also literature. Now, therefore, this English language is important when you talk about the imperialist project. And uh, with the imperialist project only, the English language came to our parts of the world. Now, uh, so in order to discuss about that, I would briefly discuss about the origin of the English language, how it came to be. Now, English is a West Germanic language brought into the Britain by Germanic invaders, like the British uh, invaded Sri Lanka, the, like the Portuguese, Dutch, and British invaded Sri Lanka and India, etc. The German, German people, Germanic invaders came and captured Britain uh, some time ago. And therefore, this language belongs to that Germanic family of languages. And this Germanic language belongs to what is called Indo-European language family. Indo-European language family, remember. Now, this is not European language family, Indo-European language family. There is a connection with India. Related, now this is related to Vedic, Indo-Aryan family of languages. Now, remember, there are language families in the world. Now, Dravidian language family is one. Indo-Aryan family is another language family. They are related. So we have a relationship with the English language. Now, these Indo-Aryan languages descend from a hypothetical proto-language. That is, proto means first language, earliest or original language. Hypothetical. Hypothetical means that is only thought to be, right? We do not know what language this is, but it is thought that there had been one particular language from which all these other languages have descended. So this, supposed to have, uh, this is supposed to have existed thousands of years ago, the proto-language, hypothetical language. And from that, 
Now, uh, as for the Indo-European studies, which is the field of linguistics, linguistics is a scientific study of language. Um, this is an interdisciplinary field of study on Indo-European languages, both current and that are no more, that are extinct. So these uh, linguists have studied uh, in detail about this. Now, if you look at this one, I have just borrowed it from the internet. The, look at this, the Indo-European family of languages uh, has several uh, language families uh, about 3,500 years before Christ, BC. Now, look at this. Now, on the extreme left, you have Indian family. Uh, you have Sanskrit, Middle Indian, Hindustani, Bengali, and other modern Indian languages. Now, even Sinhalese belong to this particular category. Now, when you move on to the right, now you can see with the green line, the Germanic family of languages, which comes down to East Germanic, Gothic, and then to West Germanic, and from West Germanic to High German and Low German, and from Low German to Anglo-Saxon or Old English. And then this Old English developed into Middle English, and then that developed into Modern English. Now this, I just put it on board just to show that there is a relationship between the English language and our languages in this part of the world. Uh, so um, that is why I asked whose language is this? Is this the Europeans language or is it our language or is it the common language? Right. Now, the, uh, the continuation of the uh, imperialist project. Uh, the, now, after now, that is how the English language came to be. Uh, but then the expansion of the English language to our part of the world is that is more important for us. Now, it expanded in two ways. Now, there are uh, what are called diaspora. You, have, you may have heard the word diaspora, the Tamil diaspora and all that. But English diaspora uh, is also there. Now, there are two diasporas, the first diaspora and the second diaspora. Now, the first diaspora means the European expansion through trade and explorations. Now, uh, that was the large scale migrations. Now, America, they found America in the 17th century and they settled down there, the British people. And then Australia in the 18th century where they dumped their prisoners uh, in Australia and New Zealand in the 19th century, South Africa in the 19th century, Canada, West Indies, etc. Now, all these countries, you know, they went and settled down there, and then they became their first language varieties. Now, uh, in those countries, they speak native uh, people uh, use English as the first, uh, their first language, or what is called the mother tongue. Now, the second diaspora is as a result of colonization. Colonization is uh, capturing uh, other nations, countries, and then uh, making their colony. Now this, that started in the second half of the 18th century. Then um, in South Asia, they captured India. Uh, of course, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh were all one country during that time and Sri Lanka, Bhutan, and also East African countries, they captured and colonized. As a result, the English language came to those countries also. Now, but once they left, now what is left with us is uh, what is called a second language varieties, English as a second language. So in Sri Lanka, we have English, but it is a second language, singular and Tamil are the more important languages, native languages. Not more important, but native languages. So English as a second language in the second diaspora. So the uh, once again, continuing the expansion, now this British influence in Southeast Asia 
or South Pacific came in the late 18th century uh, to countries like Singapore, Malaysia, Hong Kong, Papua New Guinea, etc., Southeast Asia, Asian countries, or South Pacific countries. And then American influence on Southeast Asia also, uh, that also came a bit late, but that spread fast in countries like Philippines. And then uh, English language also spread to neighboring countries like Taiwan, Japan, Korea, etc. Now, uh, these countries are also using the English language at different levels of intensity. Right. Now, talking about the English languages in post colonial Asia. Now, what is post colonial Asia? Colonial era ended when they uh, withdrew from the colonies like Sri Lanka. Now, Sri Lanka gained independence in 1948, India, Pakistan, 1947. That way, uh, they sort of left our parts of the world and therefore we got independence. Now, post-colonial means after the colonial period, right? So, um, uh, so um, uh, immediately after leaving and also before leaving, the it was the English was the language of the rulers. In fact, it should be pre-colonial Asia. It, it is called the Queen's language. And then that was the language of governance and administration. All the governing business was done in English. And that was the language of education. And um, a few people were educated in the local languages, but the more important education was given in the English, English media. And the language of judiciary, uh, low faculty students may know, uh, it had been English and even now, to some extent, it is the English language, uh, the language of judiciary, language of the upper classes, and it was the language of the upper classes uh, of the country uh, in the post-colonial Asia. Now, once again, this uh, also continued what I call the dichotomies, the binary oppositions, or the dualities. Now, how? English educated upper class of natives versus vernacular educated underdogs. Vernacular means local language educated, Sinhala and Tamil. Underdogs means the people who are not very prominent, uh, the, the second class kind of citizens, right? And then powerful English language versus the powerless native languages. So this is the dichotomy, binary opposition. Superior English language versus inferior native languages. Now, always English things were superior, powerful, uh, and uh, the local things were less powerful, less important, and all that. So this dichotomy continues. Um, so um, now look at this, East-West dichotomy. Now this was the validating ground for imperialism, colonialism, uh, imperialism and Western hegemony. Now look at these words, what is this? Validating ground, Valid anybody who understands validating ground? What is validating ground? Supportive facts. Huh? Supportive facts. Supportive? Supportive uh, background or something like yeah, that. Yeah, supporting background to some extent. Mm, that is, you know, that gives the rationale for something. Uh, the authority or the power uh, and to rationalize that, uh, 
uh, why imperialism is acceptable because of east west dichotomy right um, that gave them the kind of authority or the power or whatever and for western hegemony imperialism and western hegemony hegemony means like uh, using their authority and power to control others hegemony 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 so they um, they are powerful and they are controlling others so for that there there was a, there was a kind of a philosophy why it can be why it should be now this is the dichotomy like look at this now west and east now these are the dichotomies or the binary oppositions powerful west powerless east cultured west and uncultured east now one validating ground was like they came and said okay these people are poor and uncultured uncivilized barbarian kind of people we have to teach them we have to educate them we have to culture them and that is one validating ground one rationale that they showed right and civilized west and uncivilized east they were civilized and eastern people they saw as uncivilized educated west and uneducated east sophisticated west and unsophisticated east normal and familiar west and exotic and strange east exotic harinikamme amutu strange exotic cultures and the superior culture and inferior cultures rich and poor so this kind of dichotomy was the validating ground for their dominance their imperialism their western hegemony in our past of the world uh now the um the uh, post colonial project now the post colonial project and that means after the independence that we got now by the mid 20th century the project changes from imperialist project to post colonial project now earlier they came to educate us uh, culture us and all that uh, uh, but actually what happened was plundering our our resources right now by the mid 20th century south asian countries including sri lanka gained independence from the british empire yet the cultural hegemony or the dominance continued through institutions created during the colonial era they have set up the mechanism to control or hegemonize our parts of the world now they have they had given us the english education democratic governance system we had kings those days but no more kings now when they left they had given us the parliament uh, and the governing system the elections and all that and the legal system that we are following uh, that we are still following legal system they gave administrative system they gave us military system they gave us the military system that we are following still is the one that we got from them the english customs and traditions adopted by the ruling elite so the people who ruled also like uh, black skinned white masters now they were black only in the skin but inside they were white and they were believing their ideologies were in line with those of the west or the british now english language assumes in this post colonial project era assumes a new role in the british commonwealth british, british commonwealth means the countries that were under them uh, as colonies and later once they uh, gave independence they were bound together as the british commonwealth so we are still commonwealth nations now all these support the continuation of the western hegemony in asia although they physically left us their hegemony remained their control remained in asia natives believe in their inferiority compared to the west now they have through their education the, uh, and also spread, spreading of the christianity and roman catholicism and all that different culture was established in sri lanka and sri lankans or the silanes people local people hela people started to begin to think that we are inferior as a nation 
we had developed what is called the inferiority complex. Now, the English language remained as what is called kadua, the sword, the symbol of oppression in the disoriented psyche of the natives. Now, our psyche, the mentality were disoriented and uh, the language, English language was a symbol of oppression. Those who knew English, they were powerful. Those who did not know English, they were poor uh, suffering people. And we used to, we, during the time we were schooling, we used to call it kadu. And, um, and uh, if somebody during the 70s, 60s, 70s, um, if somebody went in a bus or a train wearing pair of trousers, somebody would come and speak to you in English. So people did not wear trousers if you did not know English because you were afraid. So that was the time uh, Kadwa was very powerful. Uh, now, meanwhile, Asian cultures that in effect were much older than the Western cultures remained on stone inscriptions and ancient Ola leaf books. Ape Puskola Potpala, Ape Gal Lenwala, Katayang Bauta Truela Tibuna, but they were just limited to those and some temples. So the hegemony continued, cultural dominance continued, the West overpowering our local cultures. Now, post colonial project once again, English language in post colonial Asia. Now, I told you earlier also, English was considered as the Kadua, and English gradually develops during this era into regional varieties, world Englishes of their own identities. Now, there is a transition from the symbol of oppression from Kadua to a tool that we can use. The, the, a transition took place after some time. Now, we began to develop what is called Sri Lankan English, Indian English, African English, etc. And now the language began to be used as the language of the uh, upper class elite and also as a tool for education. Still, there was this class domination. Now, those who knew English, they were like superior class. But it, was, it began to be used for education. Now, it, has, it gradually became a part of our own cultures. Now, it began to be used as what is called the lingua franca or the interlanguage that is the link language among different nationalities among the other nations in, within the country and in Asia and the rest of the world. Now say the Tamils, Muslims, Sinhalese people, they used English as the interlanguage or the lingua franca or the link language to communicate amongst themselves. And also to communicate amongst the other Asian countries when you go to India, Japan, other countries to communicate that. Now, uh, I stopped here uh, saying that, okay, there, there is a new turn uh, in the evolution of the English language in our part of the world. Now, the Kadua has become a tool. And uh, so different varieties of English began to be developed. Now, earlier it was the British Standard English and everybody was trying to learn that particular English, but now, Things have changed since then. Now, the language has begun to be used as an interlanguage, link language, a language that connect communities together. Now, it, is, it began to be used as a tool for education. Now, very important thing happened in the 1980s. Now, a person called Braj B. Kachru, he developed a model called 
concentric model of world Englishes in the mid 1980s. Concentric means the center is one, around the center, there is a circle, and then uh, there are different layers in this model. World Englishes, instead of one English, they are developed what is called world Englishes. Now, this is a, uh, this is a potch making event, and he introduced what is called inner circle, outer circle, and expanding circle. Now, it can be seen clearly here. Now, this is the Kachru's, uh, Raj Kachru's circular uh, approach. Now, the, as you see the inner circle, is represented by the native speaker, it's a speaker countries like United Kingdom, USA, Australia, New Zealand, etc. And uh, during that time, it was like 380 million speakers. Now that the figures have changed to now roughly about 380 million speakers. Now the next immediate circle is identified as the outer circle where English is used now in countries like India, Nigeria, Philippines, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Malaysia, Tanzania, Kenya, Anglo Anglophone, South Africa, and Canada, all these countries using English as a second language. Now, a similar number of almost close to that number of people, about 300 million speakers in this part of the world. And then, the expanding circle, uh, countries like China, Russia, Japan, most Europe, most of the Europe, uh, Korea, Egypt, Indonesia, etc. They are in the expanding circle. They are again up to one billion speakers who are using the English language. So now he has shown how the English language has spread into different varieties and different levels of usage. Now, um, uh, inner circle, that is identified uh, by Kashru as norm providing. Now the inner circle countries, they provide the norm, the grammar, the, the correct words, the vocabulary, the everything, the, the norm was given by them. And they are the people who are the owners of that particular language, inner circle. Right, um, and then outer circle, non developing now, especially former colonies it's like Sri Lanka, Pakistan, India, etc. Now, here we use it as a second language or what is called lingua franca, and now we are developing the norms. Now, we have now by this time developed what is called Sri Lankan English, what is called Indian English, and what is called uh, African English, etc. So different geographical areas developing English language separately from the native language that we borrowed from the British. And then the expanding circle that is norm dependent, they depend on the norm provided by the norm providing countries like UK and USA. Those are countries like China, Japan, Russia, Nepal, South Korea, Egypt, and non-anglophonic Europe. Now in those countries, they learn it as a foreign language and not as a second language. So they, they don't have any historical or governmental role. They mainly learn the language for international communication. So they learn it as a foreign language for international communication. But in our countries, we use it for education and for uh, inter, inter community, inter uh, like between Tamils, Muslims, etc. for that communication also, in addition to international communication. So here we see the classification, a native language, English as a native language, ENL, uh, in countries like America, UK, etc. Second language, ESL, English as a second language in countries like ours, and foreign language, EFL, in countries like Japan, Korea, China, etc. This again is the same thing, Pachro's model. Then, 
Another important thing, and we are so far talking about the language. Now, now these Englishes are identified as new Englishes. We have our own right. We have the differences that are accepted, like pronunciation, etc. There are acceptable differences in our culture, in Sri Lankan culture, Sri Lankan English, Indian English, etc. So new Englishes developed as Kashtu has shown. Uh, the, the dominating figure of the English language has been reduced. Now it is more and more used for practical requirements and practical purposes. Now, another thing also developed, but it's called new literatures. Now, literature, Sahitya, is also an important factor in uh, dominance, hegemony. Through literature, the storytelling, people in our parts of the world were made to believe that you are inferior, you are second class citizens. And we, we had uh, literature, single literature, Tamil literature, etc. but we devalued them and we thought the English literature is the best literature because they propagated that story. And now after post-colonial period, another development that took place, the change, that is called post-colonial literatures or new literatures. Now the literature, post-colonial literature means the literature written by people from former colonized countries like India, South Africa, Africa, Sri Lanka, etc. Now, these literatures address the problems and consequences of the decolonization of a country. Colonization, opposite decolonization, once that is decolonized, there are different problems coming up. Now, we don't have our roots, we have a different system planted. And uh, so lots of problems coming up in countries like ours in Africa. And then people start write, started writing about this, especially the, the questions relating to the political and cultural independence of formerly subjugated people, whether we are really independent, although we got independence. People began to question through literature and they started dealing with themes such as racialism, now, racialism is something that we inherited from the colonies, colonization. Now, Tamil singular problem, all that we have inherited from that. Earlier, we used to live together, but they divided and ruled. And after that, racialism, colonialism, all these issues, they began to discuss in literature, people in our parts of the world, in the English medium. Now, also new literary theories, also evolved. Now, very important thing, some of these may not be very relevant to you, but some, at least one or two people may find it interesting. Uh, one day you might just, you know, uh, if you get a chance, just uh, have at the back of your mind, there are people like this. Now, there's a person called Edward Said, and he is a post-colonial critic. He questioned the role of literature in continuing cultural imperialism. Physically, although they left, now they had their tools. Literature is one tool. Through literature, they continued to hold their hegemony. That is called cultural imperialism. They, they wanted to maintain the culture that they established in our parts of the world. Cultural imperialism or colonialism. So Edward Said wrote a book called Orientalism in 1978. Now he's a Palestinian American uh, and he critiques or questions the Eurocentric cultural imperialism. Eurocentric, the center is Europe. Cultural imperialism, so they are the powerful center. And that is the continuation of the project, post-colonial project that I call. Now, this man, Edward Said, questioned that. And he describes and critiques the West's portrayal of the East. Now, West portray or show the East the way they want. The East is called the Orient, Asia, North Africa, and Middle East. They are called Orient. Uh, the West is called Occident. So that, that is why Orientalism, 
They paint a picture called Orientalism. Now, now Orientalists, once again in dichotomy, Orientalism and uh, Imperialism, Western, uh, this thing. And when you say um, now Oriental things, now they are less important. They paint it black so that theirs can shine white. So uh, some novels by E.M. Forster's Passage to India in 1924, a novel, and Leonard Wolf's Village in the Jungle, written in Sri Lanka. Leonard Wolf was a white um, uh, governor, sorry, uh, agent, government agent in Sri Lanka, British. And he wrote a book called The Village in the Jungle, which was translated into Badgama and filmed later on where Vijay Kumaratan who is the, uh, acting the baboon's character. And those through those books, they spread their story that these are uncultured, you know, uneducated, uncivilized kind of people, and they have to be brought up and educated and all that kind of mythology, that story they propagated. And now with Orientalism, Edward Said questioned all that. And another important work was Empire Rights Back, 1989, by some Australian professors, Bill Ashcroft, Gareth Griffith, Helen Tiffin, Empire Rights Back. Just note these books and keep it somewhere. One day you might find it interesting to read. Um, whatever the disciplines you are in, right? Empire Rights Back, very seminal works, Orientalism and Empire Rights Back. This is a radical critique of Eurocentric notions of language and literature. Eurocentric notions, they are the center. Attack so it investigates how the post-colonial texts constitute a radical critique of Eurocentric notions of literature and language. They were questioning that. And then new writers emerged. Mm, these are the uh, post, uh, these are the new English, new literatures writers, like people like R.K. Narayan in Eng India, Mulk Raj Anand, Raja Rao in India, African writers like Chinua Achebe, Wal Soinka, they uh, started portraying the rich local cultures through the English language. Very beautiful novels you should read, Narayan, Mulk Raj Anand, Chinua Achebe, etc. You find the books if possible and read them. They, they show the beauty of our parts of the world uh, in the English language. We have, they have tried to establish their cultures, the richness of our cultures. Now, uh, now uh, look at this. Now the language used on the internet. Now the English language has changed, English literature has changed. Uh, now it has become more sort of domesticated, and uh, that is well spread throughout the world, uh, not just a symbol of power. Now look at this, I have borrowed it once again from the internet and you can see the usage of in the internet. Um, now with internet, things have changed. Now 55.7, sorry, yeah. There's another slide. Okay, now the next one is what is called the globalization and the role of the English language. Now we talked about the imperialism and the role of English language, post-colonial era and the English language, and then the globalization and the role of the English language. This is the evolution, the change of the English language uh, usage in our parts of the world. Now, what is globalization? I don't have to tell you, you know what globalization means. Now, some people argue that this globalization began in, with uh, Christopher Columbus in 1400s, um, the capturing uh, countries, you know, discovering the new world, but real globalization took effect with the, with the uh, 21st century, with the spread of uh, technology, internet and all that. Now, how do we define globalization? Globalization refers to the integration between people, companies, and governments on a global scale, a larger connection. Uh, so economic globalization, cultural globalization, political globalization, we are one world, one community, economically, culturally, politically, and that is what they say. But still, the question is underneath whether 
we all have the equal treatment. Are we equal? Now, there is a question whether it is a continuation of the economic, cultural, and political hegemony of the West, the controlling of the West through what is called globalization. Now, globalization speeded up with the advancements of ICT and modern technology in the 21st century. Now, in this present context, once again, the English language plays a significant role in globalization as well. Now it has become a tool for communication, not as a clear symbol of power and status to dominate, but it is used for technological advancements and knowledge sharing, knowledge gathering, etc. Without English, almost, I mean, in this world of technology, nothing could be done. So it has become an essential tool. Now, discussion uh, and propagation of non-European values, now we, through Facebook and uh, YouTube and all these things, we are propagating our values also through the use of the English language. Now, there is uh, that kind of empire rights back, empire plays back. Now, from the former empire, now we are passing our values also. So now it is used as the common language for the whole world, English language. See the evolution of the language. Now, I told you at the beginning that language changes, everything changes, culture changes. Now, you can see then this one, how much it is used. 60%, um, 55.7% of English is used in the internet. Uh, and then uh, that is, I mean, other languages are nowhere comparable. And uh, the number of users also, the English language is used by uh, about 565 million and others are nowhere near. So English has gained a new uh, identity. Right. Now, with that background about the evolution of the English language in our part of the world and how uh, it has changed, now I would like to talk a little bit about what is called pan Asianism, uh, pan Asianism versus Eurocentricism. Now, this pan Asian ideology versus Euro European ideology. Now, this pan-Asian ideology is an ideology that promotes the political and economic unity and cooperation of Asian people. This is against like, this is like in reaction to uh, the, the, what is called the Euro-American dominance in the globalized world. Now in the globalized world, I said, there's a question whether it is the control of the Euro-American system that what is called globalization. Now in reaction to that, some Asian countries got together and they thought, okay, we have to have a pan-Asian ideology and they had a project. Now that is called pan-Asianism. So this is led by countries like Malaysia, Singapore, Japan, South Korea, and it attempts to identify common Asian customs, values, traditions, and particularly through Confucian values. Confucius, as you know, is a philosopher, a Chinese philosopher. Is, uh, it is very much powerful in China and uh, 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 spell, special set of values are being propagated. So based on that, they were trying to have what is called pan-Asian ideology. And it is a cultural and a political ideology which defines elements of social norms, ethical values, traditional customs, belief systems, artifacts and technologies common to the nations of Southeast Asia, especially, and East Asia, both historically and presently. Now, uh, now the basic commonality, common thing of collectivism is used to unify people for their economic and social good and to create a pan-Asian identity. So collectivism is the principle around which they were trying to unite 
Asian nations. Now, it challenges the Western ideals of individualism felt to be incompatible with the Asian regions. Now, individualism is related with democracy, uh, um, uh, human rights, and all these things are related with individualism propagated by the West and American uh, nation. So, however, now this also has not been very successful. Now, this was in fact economic and political. Now they were having the, 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 the Europeans having the Euro and uh, all that, and uh, the Pan-Asian uh, community also wanted to have some kind of a uh, definite single uh, money, unit of money, et cetera, but that has not developed that far. However, Pan-Asian ideology is yet another binary opposition, a dichotomy against an Euro-American Euro ideology or their hegemony in the globalized world. Now, there again, it is something against something, Eurocentricism versus Pan-Asianism, retaliation, reaction to that one. So, then I will talk about the commonality of cultures and ideologies. Now, what is common for cultures and ideologies? Cultural disharmony versus cultural harmony. Now, can we identify any common feature that is an unbroken line or strand in the usage of language and literature throughout our history. And we have been having these ideological battles in the world in about five centuries time. Can we find any common feature? There are plenty of ideological battles, frontiers. The answer is, the diverse cultural identities and diverse ideologies used for, are used for division, dividing, separation, conflicts, domination, and suppression of others and oppression of others, and for all the negative things that our world has been experiencing. Now, um, see the Tamil culture versus Sinhala culture, and, uh, and Pakistan versus Indian, uh, religious Buddhist versus Christian, uh, Islamic versus Christian, all these are there, all conflicts, ideologies and cultures, they are going into conflicts and then domination and suppression. And this is what has been happening throughout the history. Now, it is a continuation of humanity through superiority and inferiority complexes. Now, some have superiority complex, some have inferiority complex, developed through dichotomies of cultural identities and ideologies, the mentally constructed unreal realities. Now, they are mentally constructed things. Now, the West colored themselves as more powerful, more educated, more cultured, so that they can suppress the East. So the minorities were like suppressed by the majorities, thinking that they are not powerful, etc. So all these ideologies and cultures were in conflict. Now, if we understand the true nature of these binary oppositions, that they are in continuous flux or change. Flux means changing. They are continuously changing. We, the Asians, and they, the Europeans, could genuinely respect different cultural identities and ideologies in complementary relationships, not in conflicting relationships. In complementary relationships, we could respect one another and we could have had mutual respect. If you knew the true nature that they are all changing, they are in flux, there is nothing permanent. The result would be compassion, respect, tolerance, understanding, loving kindness, etc. 
So the dichotomy would be different. Now, if you take an example, black versus white ideology, white is there because the black is there. So you paint one black so that you can shine as white. But instead of that kind of conflicting ideology, if we can find an ideology where black and white together, black and white ideology that is both in complementary relationship, respecting one another, then that would be the ideal for the humanity to progress in a proper way. So the problem and the solution. Now in Pan-Asian ideology, is it a solution or is it a temporary alternative? And we are talking about an Asian ideology, right? Towards cultural linkages, towards an Asian ideology, that is our main theme. So is Pan-Asian ideology a solution or is it a temporary alternative? I think it is a temporary alternative because it still continues that conflicting dichotomy is the binary oppositions. Now, does it touch upon the deeper nuances of fundamental Asian values of unconditional compassion? Now, unconditional compassion is a fundamental Asian value. Loving kindness, karmava, dayava, uh, to all beings, simplicity, equality, samanatmatave, and equanimity found in Asian philosophies like in the pristine Buddha Dhamma, which shows the negativity of dualistic thinking. Now, Buddha Dhamma shows the negativity of dualistic thinking, dichotomous thinking, and at the root of which exists raga what is called mental attachment with liking, raga, alima, and vesha or dosa, mental attachment with dislike. But either you like something or you dislike something. Either you love something or you hate something. And that is the dichotomy. And that is dualistic thinking. That is the line throughout my lecture that I have been trying to uh, point out with dichotomies and all that. So all these ideologies, the cultures and all that, you know, propagating this raga and vesha. They, they constitute the root causes for all conflicts in human existence. All conflicts in human existence is because of the raga and moha. Those are in the presence of moha, that is ignorance of reality, real, real reality. So in conclusion, I propose that we in Sri Lanka share with most Asian nations some of the above attributes, irrespective of differences in religions, because at the base of our cultures lie these values that are distinctly identifiable from those from, of the West. This, I believe, would pave us a path for an Asian ideology that does not compete with this Western ideologies, no competition. Instead, it will serve as an alternative ideology that anyone, anywhere in the world could share as an ideology that propagates peace and harmony among people and nations anywhere in the world. A world, a universal ideology that can be passed on through the medium of the international language of English, because now the, at the current moment, in the contemporary era, English is the most popular language, common language through which we can communicate with one another uh, in different nations. And it may, may also change in the future, you never know, but currently English is the language. Uh, so, it is the only language commonly shared by most countries in the world, which I believe is the new role of the English language in the 21st century. And we, the Asians, are grateful to the West for providing us the common link that is the English language.
and that concludes my lecture thank you and uh, if you have any questions i think we have been allocated about 10 minutes for questions and answers i'm sure uh, most of you may not have understood 100% of this lecture i know that but i do not also expect that you would gain you know get, get everything gain uh, you know gain that knowledge the complete knowledge but but i intended was to uh, make some kind of an eye opening uh, for you all to think differently as sri lankans as asians and to think of our cultural values uh, the the strengths that we have, and also to be uh, more sort of uh, the prominent in our heritage and to be aware of our heritage and also to discover further. Any questions? Uh, there is uh, in the chat box, there is something. Uh, Sir, why didn't uh, the Pan Asian ideology not work out? Yeah, uh, I. I I think it is like, we, we can't say it did not work out and uh, fully, but the, their expectations are like, you know, once again, uh, just to react to the cultural hegemony of the West. And that, that is a reaction to that. And also like uh, the lack of commonality, although we tried to sort of develop it artificially, in Asia also there are countries like China, Japan, etc. And they, they, they are of you know, their own powers. And uh, this is like, um, so actually, although they were trying to build it up around the collectivism, uh, the agenda was a political and economic one. And countries like Malaysia, Singapore are the new emerging Asian uh, economies. And uh, so amongst them also, there can be a kind of competitive nature. So maybe there can be other reasons also, but uh, uh, that has not developed well into one coherent uh, Asian ideology. Uh, once again, uh, my position is that that again is you know related to raga and desha, and therefore therefore that is going to fail. Uh, when we are talking about the opposite cultures in Asia, like underworld communities, do they have any impacts upon globalization of Asian uh, region? Uh, what do you mean? Uh, when you're talking about the opposite cultures in Asia, like underworld community. Now, of course, now the underworld, now that is, of course, a different kind of a culture, like underworld culture, yeah. Uh, uh, do they have any impact upon globalization of Asian people? Uh, now, globalization, of course, takes place through proper, not by the underworld people, but by the international business, uh, communication links, and we, we, we can't you know, live alone today in the world. And uh, if we don't have GDPT today, uh, so, all right, I'm back and I got, the Wi-Fi got disconnected. Now I joined with the dongle. Uh, I, I, uh, Ms. Tyranny, I think, Yes, uh, okay, I think uh, you can continue. And uh, finally, let me, I uh, think there are no other questions to ask and uh, uh, let me thank the, the students for the participation. And also let me thank Tirani, uh, Ms. Tirani Vijayavikrama for coordinating. And especially let me thank Dr. Hemantha Premaratna, uh, the uh, person who has introduced this concept to KDU and to our faculty and the whole project, and uh, thank you so much. Thank you, thank sir. You. So, please, uh, sir, please wait for a few minutes for a word of thanks. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's my pleasure to deliver the word of thanks on behalf of the students of the short course on cultural linkages towards as 
and Asian ideology. First, I would like to thank you, lecturer Mr. Kitsiri Amaratunga, for sharing his time and knowledge with us and for delivering this important lecture amidst his busy schedule. Sir, your address set the tone for this course by clearly indicating the role of English as cultural linkage in Asia. We are blessed to have you contribute to this course. Next, I wish to thank Dr. Hemant Premaratna and all other staff at KDU who have brought these lectures together. Thank you. Last but not least, I thank all participants from our university for joining us today. Your participation has made this lecture a successful event, and I believe it has provided you with an insight into the role of the English language towards an Asian ideology. To conclude, let me once more express my gratitude to Mr. Kitsiri Amaratunga for delivering today's lecture. Sir, it is an honor to have you with us and your time and efforts are deeply appreciated. Thank you.